I have righteous indignation. I believe firmly that there's a moral order to the universe. I don't believe in vengeance. I keep it moving. That's been the theme of my life is to keep it moving. I cannot wallow in pity. I give myself like 15 minutes and I got to move on because I know I've seen what it does to people and I don't want to be the walking around angry person holding all of this stuff inside me because I think it it leads to really bad things for the for the individual. I don't want to hold that in me I, I, because that would make me like them because I think all of that comes out of fear and anger and it's not how I want my life to be. Welcome to the Dandelion Effect podcast, a space for organic conversation about the magic of living a connected life. Just like the natural world around us, we are all linked through an intricate web, a never-ending ripple that spans across the globe. Here, we explore the ideas that our guests carry through the world, remember who and what inspired them along the way, and uncover the seeds that help them blossom into their unique version of this human experience. This podcast is a production of the Feather Pipe Foundation, whose mission is to help people find their direction through access to programs and experiences that support healing, education, community, and empowerment. Dr. Helen Benjamin is the president of HSV Consulting, a company that provides board and management development, strategic planning, and equity, diversity, and inclusion services to community colleges. She's had a long career in education. With a master's degree and doctorate from Texas Women's University, Helen began as a teacher and has also held positions as a professor, dean, chancellor, and president during her more than 30 years in administration for community colleges in Texas and California. She retired in 2016 and is living in Dallas, Texas, though retirement for her looks like sitting on the board of several organizations, serving through HSV Consulting, and writing and editing books. Helen and I met at the Featherpipe Ranch in summer 2022, where she attended a retreat hosted by San Diego-based yoga teachers Lenita Varshell and Diane Ambrosini. She signed up hoping to find peace and respite, and as she shares in this conversation, she was able to access it in the innate beauty and tranquility of the ranch, the movement classes, and the like-minded people she met. Born in 1950, Helen grew up in Alexandria, Louisiana, in the heart of the segregated South, where African Americans were forbidden by law to attend schools, restaurants, churches, shops, and other public places. Of course, we learn about slavery and racial segregation in history books, but how often do you have the chance to hear from someone whose life, especially early life, has been so directly affected by the fear that upheld these beliefs? This history isn't as old as we might imagine, and at age 73, Helen speaks of her upbringing, how she found inspiration, community, and love despite the bigotry that surrounded her family and friends. She's a similar age to many in the founding group at the Feather Pipe Ranch, but her reality during the hippie era, we speak of so mystically and magically, was drastically different than that of our founders. And that's why we want to highlight this story. I ask her about her inner process of alchemizing the feelings that can stem from injustice, her spiritual path and ability to find peace and freedom within, and the importance of documenting the stories of her community and preserving history in order to move forward. We talk about her recent book titled How We Got Over, Growing Up in the Segregated South, which is a memoir of 24 personal accounts from African Americans who graduated from Peabody High School in Alexandria, Louisiana. This book captures the essence of black life in the Deep South during Jim Crow laws and was born out of an epiphany Helen had while attending a diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop. She realized that where she grew up, between the railroad tracks, was systematically set up through redlining and that her rise to where she sat now, in a leadership role for a college in New York, defied all odds. The stories of her and her classmates, who also went on to live full and accomplished lives, had to be told. This conversation gave me chills on several occasions. Helen's life has been one of service and sovereignty, showing what's possible when you embody the values of freedom, fairness, and worthiness, and don't allow outside messages to break you down. 
I'm Andy Vantrees, and you're listening to the Dandelion Effect podcast with today's guest, Helen Benjamin. A good place to start is just an acknowledgement of how you and I know each other and how we met at the Feather Pipe Ranch last year. And at the Feather Pipe, there's kind of a crew of people who were around when it began in the 70s. And one of those elders is Howard. And so every workshop, Howard gets in front of a group of people. It's like his biggest thrill to tell the story of how India inherited the land at the Feather Pipe Ranch and how, you know, they traveled all through Europe and the Middle East and India when they were in their young 20s, kind of, you know, on this train of looking for some higher purpose, some form of enlightenment, some form of like an answer to what the heck are we doing here? But from what I know of the uh, interaction between you and Howard, you were in a workshop listening to this story of they're gallivanting around and just kind of having freedom of movement and being a part of that hippie era. The way that this hippie era story is told from the perspective of certain people is kind of sometimes told as a universal, like this is what was happening at the time. And I'm just so excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about a very different reality during those years and during those decades I was listening to him that day and you kind of have to know Howard, I guess. And and I got to know him better after that. I'm in the audience and we're all sitting in this room and just happy go lucky. as though this is the way the world was, you know, this is what you did. And I'm just thinking, I don't think this guy has a clue that there was other stuff going on in the world. And I, and I wasn't being hypercritical of him because I, we all are in our own bubbles. And we live our lives the way we live them. So I try not to be critical of people, but I am a critical thinker. And my critical thinking just went into motion there. And I just felt this strong urge to just talk to him. And I said something like, I just have to tell you that your life was so different. I said, now, exactly what years were these? I said, so let me tell you what I was doing in those same years. I was in segregated South. I only knew that India existed because we studied it in history, like fifth or sixth grade or something. You know, these were things that were just not in my existence. And so I was saying to him that everybody's existence wasn't that way. I said, you were there doing that, this kind of happy go. He's just telling it with so much glee and just excitement about it. And he should have been excited about it. But Mm -hmm. I felt obligated to say to him that there were people in other parts of the world in the United States who were not living that way. I said, I didn't even know that such opportunities existed, that that part of the world was even open to me. Mm -hmm. And he was a little defensive at first, which was understandable. And we talked more. I think he, he thought more about it. He brought me pictures the next day to show me of people who were there and a couple of uh, African-American women, but they were from the East. They were from, well-to-do families, and they were married to white men. Mm-hmm. And, and one of them was married to a white doctor. So that's a, something else, with the, which at that time, th- there would be no way I, I would identify with that. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing, though, he had talked about VJ. He told her what I told him. And she was, you know, of course, a huge part of this story, wonderful woman. And she she came to see me, and she apologized to me. And she thanked me. She said, I never thought of that. And I just wanted to come and thank you and apologize to you. And I said, you don't owe me an apology. That was your life. That was the life you knew. My point is just that you need to be aware that everybody didn't have that life and that opportunity. They just did all kinds of things. And he told us a story about going to Hawaii in shorts and no shoes and flying (laughs) on an airplane. And when he met Hubert Humphrey in Hawaii and so much of what happened to him was because he wasn't identifiably a person of color. Yeah, there was there was a freedom of of movement a freedom of opportunity. And that was a point I made to him. I said, you had freedom that we could not even dream of. There was no way we could even dream of it. 
And so what years were you talking about? And, and can you tell me a bit more about what was life like for you in the South? My hometown is in central Louisiana, a small town called Alexandria. And we were in segregated schools. Of course, this was, uh, I started school in first grade in 1956 and I graduated in 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. He died, I think it was April 4th. My birthday was on April 1st. I remember this. I was just, just, we were all just devastated. Mm -hmm. And then we graduated on May 18th or something like that. And I still have my graduation program. His picture is on the cover of our graduation program. Dr. King had been to Alexandria in 1966. We were living in our segregated community. We had um, one high school for African-Americans, public, one public high school for whites. They lived on one side of the tracks. We lived on the other. And on our side of the tracks, we had lumber yards and animal processing plants, all kinds of industries. I mean, we should all have something as a result mm. of what we were breathing. But we loved our high school, Peabody High School. We loved it. <laughs> we still love our high school. <laughs> I, I describe school as a respite. Mm. It was the place we could go where we could imagine and dream. And all of our teachers were Black like us. They had been where we were. They cared about us. They saw hope and promise in us and encouraged us to do great things, to not have fear. And school was just, I've always loved school. And so I've been in school all my life from first grade because I worked in schools. So I, I never left school. <laughs> but it was the source of freedom. I have a, a friend, Dr. Harry Robinson, who is the founder and CEO of the African American Museum in Dallas. And he says, and I agree with him, that museums, especially African-American museums, are institutions of freedom. Mm. And I apply that to schools as well. They help you see the way. And we we never got new books. We never got books that didn't have somebody's names in them already. They got the new books. And then we got the books they had used. Mm -hmm. People we never knew, never met. Despite its drawbacks. It was an existence in which we thrived to the, to the extent that we could. We had communities that supported us, the neighbors, everybody knew everybody pretty much. That statement about it takes a village and th that's what we were. Yeah. It's not to say that it was perfect. There was no crime or anything like that, but we cared about each other and, and our teachers, especially we had a principal, my God, we had probably 1200 students in our high school, he knew every kid and he knew your mama, you know, that, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of amazing angel on earth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he was, he, he just cared so much about a lot of people hated him because he was just so strict, but he had very high expectations of us. Mm -hmm. And most of us tried to live up to his expectations. So it was uh, an environment in which we didn't have anything, but we had our community. We had our churches, we had ministers who were also very important in our lives. Uh, they ran Sunday school and vacation Bible school and had us memorizing all kinds of things from the Bible. I know you'd be surprised all the stuff I know about the Bible, but because <laughs> I was in in church all the time in a town like ours, we, where everybody who's running everything is white. You look outward and you look at the, the marches and you look at how whites are reacting to that, but we never had anything like that in our hometown. It was all pretty much controlled and uh, a few little demonstrations. But, and I learned out the demonstrations when I did the book, when about the, and I was right there. I had no idea any of that was going on. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. Because my parents, I think like so many other parents had this, that innate fear yeah. that comes with living in an environment in that way. And it was, you know, keep your head down, do what you're supposed to do. I had been seeing on television that, we were quote unquote free and we could sit on the front of the bus and whatever. And, and I was the oldest. And so I'd have to run errands. I'd have to go to the bus stop. And I was in, and I was by myself and I was usually with my friend Jackie. And I decided I was going to sit on the front of that bus. And I sat behind the driver 
what was that experience like for you that that choice that like this is going to be something that I'm going to do today I just know I was buoyed by what I had seen and the fact that it, it was over you know and I just did it and he didn't do or say anything and I didn't do anything but sit in that seat the black folk rode the bus anyway there were rarely white people on the bus and we'd all be sitting in the back of the bus it just didn't make sense you know, you said that like your parents, and I imagine the generations of your parents and your grandparents, like this built in generational control and fear that then trickled into prob- into your generation as protection, of course. Yes, they, they want you to live. There had been examples of what happens if you don't. Like, how did that exist with also the existence of being somewhere like school where you're dreaming and you're studying geography and you're um, imagining and then you know these pieces of reality like how internally and psychologically did you um, hold that I did a speech uh, I was in California a long time and the Richmond California NAACP invited me to be their speaker the speech was about my life is a series of contradictions Mm. just based on living in that town. I thought about how in elementary school, we'd have to go to music every week. I think it was on Fridays. And we had this teacher, music teacher, she was beautiful voice. And oh, she could just really play the piano. She was wonderful. And she had us singing all these patriotic songs. This is my country, land of my birth. This is my country, grandest on earth. I pledge thee my allegiance, America the bold, but this is my country to have and to hold. I held on to, I believed that. I love America. I do. I love what it stands for. It does not live up to it. It does not begin to live up to it. But the principles on which it is founded are just so sound to me. Mm -hmm. It's disappointing that Things are the way they are, and and people don't live up to that in my analysis of it. But I think those principles are just so good Mm -hmm. and so strong and affirming and all of that. And so I have that in me. So I'm in there singing these songs. And then I'd have to get on the bus and sit in the back. Yeah. My mother would send me to town, and I'd walk through Cress's or W.T. Grant, and they'd have a lunch counter in there. And the hamburgers just smelled so good, you know, just, and I couldn't have one. And then I had to go to the colored fountain. So just these contradictions over here, I'm being taught, I'm seeing in my history book, all of what the Declaration of Independence says. We had to re- memorize the preamble to the Constitution, stand before the class and recited all this stuff they put into us. Mm-hmm. And then I go out and I, I'm not a beneficiary of that at all. Mm-hmm. But things were were quiet in my town. And and I remember my friend Jackie and I decided one day we were going to go to that counter and W.T. Grant. And this is kind of how integration happened in our town. We just kind of eased into it. And we were going to order a hamburger. We would go through there all the time saying we were going to do it. We were going to do it. We were going to do it. And then one day we did it. And then we just kept doing it and doing it, doing doing it. Did that feel like a turning point for you when you went and with Jackie ordered that hamburger? Was it, was it a big deal or was it like, let's see if we can do this? We were, we were kind of scared to do it. My mother knew nothing about any of this. I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) And I was driving at 15. That that was the thing that's kind of surprised me. My dad, when I turned 15, he says, you're going to get a driver's license. And then for each one of us, there are four of us. When we became uh, sophomores in college, he got us a car there was no big speech or anything. And he gave me that. Yeah. I didn't know at the time what a gift it was. And as I reflect on it, I think that one thing that he did just told me so many things that I had his support, that I could do anything I wanted to do, you know, because no other girls I knew were driving. Nobody was driving. I was all over the place in that car. (laughs) Well, and you probably had all the friends who were like, she's got a car. We're going with her. <laughs> no, it was. I knew I couldn't do that because they'd send my uh, telltale brother with me all the time. <laughs> but it's a sense of freedom. Yes. And that has made me the kind of woman I am, which is not always good. I was driving by guys' houses. They had no wheels. I had wheels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I even remember 
getting my first car too. And it's like the world, something opens up for you. You feel independent, you feel free, you feel like the possibilities have just expanded exponentially. Yeah. And I don't know what made dad do that because he had nine siblings, but they didn't do that. My first cousin was a year older than me. And I thought her dad was really cool, but he was different from dad. I'm the only girl I know who was driving. It sounds like there's these values that you were raised with, but also these gifts, like not material gifts, but these inner gifts, these like strengths that your parents gave you. Yes. The intangibles. Just knowing a little bit about you now and what your life has been and what your work has been and just like the way that you have lived at the core of this, there's a deep belief that you can do this despite, you know, some of the narrative of your younger years and even the narrative of current events. Where did that come from? The thing that they always told us, and this was my mother's thing, don't worry so much about what other people are doing. Make sure you are doing the right thing. That was a mantra. That was one mantra. Mm -hmm. Another mantra was, I don't know what you're going to do when you're 18, but you will not live here. (laughs) You, you got to go. So my brother, the youngest of us is 10 years younger than me. And he is so funny. He said he would hear them saying that to us. And he was a little boy and he can remember being five and six years old and thinking, Oh my God, what am I going to do? He said he was just worried. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, I I got to get my plan in place. (laughs) And the way this is played out, we all left. That was what they wanted. And now my mother wants us all back, right? Of course. And so we said, you told us to leave. We did what you told us to do. But my, my mother's parents were sharecroppers, okay? And my father's parents were sharecroppers also. However, his father was... Oh, he was just something, just wiry. He was a little man and you would think he was six feet tall. And he's just the way he carried himself. So they moved from the country. He started, they started building highways in Louisiana. So around 1956, 57, they left. They were all over the place. And my parents would let me go visit them. Mm. Whatever town they were in, I would go in the summer. I, I'm you're making me think about this. That was just freeing for me, I guess. And yeah. then- My mother's mother lived on a farm. She was in a sharecropping environment and her husband died in 1953 and she didn't remarry. He was her second husband. And she kept that farm into the sixties. She ran it. She was so tough and she was a small woman, but everybody respected her uh, blacks and whites in that community. And she took nothing off nobody. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was just the toughest woman I know. (laughs) She Mm -hmm. was really something. So we love to go to her house. So every summer till I was 13, I was at her house. And so she had all these animals. She had chickens and ducks (laughs) and geese and and we'd feed the chicken. She had a garden and there were just cotton fields all around for which she was responsible because she had these children, you know, and even after it got down to her and two more, they were still doing it. So I would go and they'd be picking cotton like end of August, September. And that was just not my thing. So they would, I can remember this quite vividly. They would say to me, it's a good thing you're smart because you would never make it on a farm. (laughs) I would go out there. I'd take them water, you know, but uh -uh, that was just way too much work. And the hot sun was too hot. Uh Oh, and it was just, when you pick cotton, there are these bowls and their hands would just bleeding, you know, just, uh, no. I'm curious, you know, you mentioned you having a life of contradictions. And I think that's really interesting because I, I think that a lot of people probably feel that way in their own ways, because we all kind of have these unique, like inner thoughts and what we're seeing in the outer world. And these things don't match up, at least from my experience, like having those contradictions can lead to anger or hardness, or why is it this way? Or why don't I get to do this? Just this kind of like, uh, feeling curious to hear more of that inner process when you come up against those contradictions. I have righteous indignation. I believe firmly that there's a moral order to the universe. All that I can control, the few things that are within my ability to control, 
I don't believe in vengeance. You know, wrongs have been done to me. I keep it moving. That's been the theme of my life is to keep it moving. I cannot wallow in pity. I give myself like 15 minutes and I got to move on because I know I've seen what it does to people. And I don't want to be the walking around angry person holding all of this stuff inside me because I think it, it leads to really bad things for the for the individual. Sickness, negative outlook on life, a person nobody wants to be around because you're angry all the time. I don't that's that's not who I am. That's not who I ever wanted to be. I can't control what white people do. What I can control is my response to that. And that's what I have responsibility for. I can kind of fight for things to do. I can speak up. I can do whatever, but I don't want to hold that in me I, I, because that would make me like them. Because I think all of that comes out of fear and anger and it's not how I want my life to be. Mm -hmm. My grandfather used to, my dad used to tell us this, that there were 10 of them and they'd be running around in the yard and this was his way of controlling them. And he would say, y'all better stop all that running around. You only got so many steps. You don't want to use them all up now. (laughs) So, you know, and that says something about time and how you use it, how you apply it to your life. He told me that a long time ago. I never forgot it. I thought that was so smart. And he said, they'd all just stop. They'd sit because they didn't want to use up all their stuff. <laughs> so funny, the things that the people in our lives and usually usually the older people in our lives tell us, and it really sticks with us. Yeah, it does. So let's talk about the book. I want to take it back to this epiphany that you had, the idea for a book and kind of this broader realization of you at the age and stage that you are in your life, putting a huge importance on preservation and on story collection and on the realization that we have to preserve our stories. Yes. Because it's history. And because without that, how are we to move forward? Right. And and not from the sense of like, let's put it in a textbook, but from the sense of let's get some first person accounts of the people who are still living, who lived through these things that maybe people never even knew happened or have forgotten. Yes. Tell me about this epiphany that you had for the book. And then really curious to hear of the process of it. Well, I was on a board a board for Excelsior College, which is the main office, I'll call it, is in Albany, New York. I was on that board for 10 years. I just got off last year, end of last year. And for the last four years that I was on the board, I was the chair of the board. And we got into DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we decided to bring in this young woman to lead a discussion, for a lead a workshop for us. She had us going through a series of activities and she was talking about redlining and and the impact of that. And she had a map. There's a a site you can go to and put in a a town and it'll tell you if they have the redlining records and they got the map and everything that shows. Mm. This was by design. Black people, people of color lived in these certain sections where railroad checks and all that. So she's talking about this. And I knew where I grew up. But I don't think I thought of it that way before. Where we lived until I was 12, there were four short streets. They all ran into what we call Texas Avenue. And each one of our streets was named for a tree. Poplar, Locust, Cedar, and Cypress. Across the street from Texas Avenue was an oak flooring plant. Behind us was a railroad track. And I've forgotten which line. And then on the other side, so you got four streets with these old houses, railroad track, railroad track, oak flooring plant, and then another lumber yard. And then behind that, a chicken processing plant. And that's where it's just, we're just in this place. And I started really thinking about it at that moment and where I was at that moment, chairing a board for a college in New York. And I'm like, how in the world? That should not have even been possible. And I just, at that moment, just thought, we got to write about this. We got to tell this story. What came to me was to write my classmates, see if they're interested in telling the story. The name of the book should be How We Got Over. There was a song, a gospel song written by Clara Ward in 1951, and we were all born in 1950. 
called How We Got Over, made famous by Mahalia Jackson and Aretha Franklin. So all of this is going on in my head. I got the title, the writers and everything. And I got off that phone and called my the person who became the co-editor, Jean Nash Johnson. What do you think? And she says, oh, hell, that's a great idea. She's married to one of my classmates. He was our valedictorian. And okay. his story is very interesting because he had already written his valedictory speech when Martin Luther King Jr. died. He rewrote it after King's death. And he still has that handwritten speech from 1968. So she and I got together and I said, well, let me call Larry and see what he thinks. And then he and I got together. We made a list and we started calling people and they all said, yes, I'll write it. And I sent them an outline of what they could include a suggested outline. And they went to work. There was no real length requirement or anything. We ended up with like 400 pages. And after I included all the history stuff, after I started collecting the stories, I thought, well, we got it. There's more. It needs context. And that's how all the research came in. We researched all about our high school, how it was formed. I have an appreciation for journalists, too. I can get upset with them as anybody can. But they tell stories. Mm -hmm. And our local paper goes way back. And then there were maybe during the Confederacy, there were like pre-Civil War, 13 local papers. I had access to all of that. Amazing. Racist as they could be, but it's all there. The other goal for me, I wanted to really document it, but I want some young person to read it and say, I am interested in history. I want to be a historian. I'm going to do, you know, because we need people to continue to carry this, this torch that is our lives and tell our stories. And I know you mentioned to me that some of the people that you asked, it was like they had been waiting. I just get chills every time I think of this, just they had been waiting to tell their stories. Right. And and Joseph Jett, uh, I think Larry called him and, and Larry said, he said, man, I'm starting a night. He said he's thinking about it and wanting to do it and leave something for his grandkids. And I had them to give me photographs, too. So some of them had photographs of great, great grandparents. Mm. And they're in the book. It's uh, it's important to us. It was not important to anybody else. We we did that. But people in our hometown were so appreciative. We brought attention to some things that people uh, have found interest in. Two of the classmates wrote about seeing a man hanging from a tree. He had been lynched. And nobody knew the name. We were trying to find out, figure out who was it. And then as I talked to different people, this one man said he was a student at St. James at the Catholic school. He says he remembers the morning because his dad was driving them to school and his dad saw it first and made them turn their heads. Mm. And then one of my friends, she died last year. She said her mother rushed home. She was maybe seven or eight. The mother took she, her sister and brother. She wanted them to see it. She saw it. Wow. And I could not rest over there. I was just like, who was this man? Yeah. What did he do? So the man who was in the car with his father and the father told him to turn his head, he became the chancellor of the Southern University system, Jim Lorenz. He found the story. And then just a month ago, a woman, she's a woman now, but she's a girl. She was in our, she went to school with us until maybe the fifth grade and they moved to New York. You want to know why they moved? I just found it out. Because that man who was lynched was her cousin and he lived with them. Oh. And they left town. You know, but it wasn't talked about. Right. Because my mother, I asked my mother about it. I asked another man, he's 93, 94, has a great memory of my friend's dad, and he has no recollection of it. I, I just don't know how they could have missed that. So in remembering things like this and going down and figuring out who this was and doing like the, the journalistic work and then also having it be through personal story investigation and word of mouth and all of that, like what is the importance of it for you? Does it feel like it's the individual story? Does it feel like the, the collective that is formed when the individual stories together? Does it feel like the story of your people, your culture and, and wanting to preserve that? Like what lights you up about it and what feels most important? What lights me up about it is how the people 
in our hometown have reacted to it. Andy, we launched our book at the Dallas Public Library that when we were in high school, we couldn't walk into. Mm. And this one woman at the library, I mean, anything I needed, I would call her. I wish I had kept notes, you know, of all the coincidental kinds of things and all the people who, who helped. So we had this opening, people knew, and it was a book signing. So our cousins and people in the neighborhood, you know, all kind of church folk, any, lots of people came that day. It was really cold too. And they'd never been to a book signing. They didn't know what that was. And, you know, we're reading, you know, you're doing what you do at a book signing. And they were fascinated. One of our classmates lives in, Doretha Perry lives in Houston. I guess it must have been like three Carlos of them who, who drove. And, you know, we had Q&A and her nephew stood up and said, we're proud of our Annie. We had to be here today. So it it just, you know, just what it has done for people, people who've read it. I got an email. They've been sitting there a while because I don't go to my Gmail that often from two white women in Alexandria who have read it. One of them wants me to let her know when I'm coming again because she wants to meet the classmates who wrote, mm -hmm. the ones who live there. And another woman said, I've got these rocket chairs on my porch. I just want to sit in, on my porch with you in a rocking chair. It's touched people in a way that I think is important and to make their lives of value. Our hometown people are reading a book. They know the streets. Mm -hmm. They know this place. Our cool spot was right here. Oh, yeah, I used to go there. Oh, I had forgotten all about that. So, And then so many people said, I have never read a whole book in my life. I read this in three days. That's why I wanted to see if I could get my hands on it yesterday, because I know it's going to be one of those books that you just fly through. Because for me, with personal stories and personal memoirs and anecdotes, it's like, it doesn't even feel like it's being read by the mind. It feels like it's being read by the heart or the soul. And that doesn't happen with everybody. The people I'm talking about are Black folk, you know, live in town. This is their story. And and we were invited, 10 of us, to California for Juneteenth last year to talk about and read and stuff like that. There are people who are interested in it. People are reading. I'm a teacher. It thrills me when people read, especially people who say, I hate reading. Yeah. But I read this. Yeah. There's something so special that can happen. Like the I was interviewing um, a woman, Stephanie Tovad, last week or a couple of weeks ago. And she's um, from Dallas as well. And she was just talking about like the resonance um, when you're with other people who have or may have similar life experiences to you. You know, we were talking about the importance of having teachers of color in wellness spaces. And I said, like, what is the importance of that to you? Like, what does that feel like to you? And she said, it's, it's a resonance that can't really be explained, but is so incredibly important. Yes. I think that it's an interesting conversation because it it's the simultaneous like recognition of difference. But mm -hmm. what I feel from you and what I feel from her uh, is like, how can it be a celebration? Right. There are remarkably good things that difference can lead to. And I am one who believes that tension is good, but you have to work through the tension. On the other side of the tension is the good thing. There's nothing wrong with disagreement. There is not, it's healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine a world with everybody like me. <laughs> the difference is what gets us to innovation mm -hmm. and, and gets to the heart of creativity. But I think most of the time we don't have the patience to work through our differences and try to reach some kind of common ground. I like to say that in the work I do now, I do a lot of consulting. I'm just a referee. I just go in and try to get people to, okay, put down your gloves. Let's see what we can do here. This doesn't make any sense. You're fighting over nothing. Mm -hmm. I just think that should be our approach to life. I, I should embrace your difference, appreciate your difference, and try to understand your difference, but really appreciate it because we all have things in common. I work in California and we had all this collective bargaining and stuff. And we went to interest-based bargaining, oh. which is the best concept ever, because you start with what you have in common. Okay. What do we all want? A good solution that works for everybody. 
What else do you want? You come up with this whole list of things you want, and then you figure out how you're going to get there instead of starting at what your differences are. Cause then you're, yeah. Cause then that's the focus. Yeah. Many times we go about it in the wrong way. And we think that because somebody's different, I don't want to talk to that person. What kind of sense does that make? I mean, it makes none to me. <laughs> How much of this, Helen, and how much of your your outlook on life and your mindset, how much of this has to do with you being on a lifelong spiritual path? That's a huge part of it. I mean, I, I have uh, a deep faith. I mean, I guess what's in you comes out. And I, I'm not a proselytizer. I'm not going around trying to convert people or anything like that. I'm just trying to live a life that might be an example because I think that's the best way you can do it. They see you and they say, well, I wouldn't mind being a little bit like her. I wonder what she, you know, instead of me telling what I do and what I am and what I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what's in you comes out from a little girl, just being up there in the country and visiting my grand, the other grandparents, wherever they were living and being in my school being a vacation Bible school that I, I went to, I, I talk about that that church. And we were not members. It was just in the neighborhood. This minister would go around in the summer and tell us when vacation Bible school was starting and and we'd all be there because they gave us cookies and stuff at the end. <laughs> you know, so, enticements. Yeah. Uh, and I worked in white people's homes. I've always had a lot of jobs. What I started when I was 14, babysitting a little girl and but I, I did Neighborhood Youth Corps, too. That was one of uh, Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty programs. So I did that, worked in a hospital. So I had a lot of different experience, And all of that was around white folk who didn't want us there. I, my parents didn't have to pay any of my graduation fees because I I had all, all of these jobs. And I did all that stuff myself. Strong work ethic. It seems like you've turned around and really used that to... Like you said, I have never left school. <laughs> Teacher and chancellor and president of board. No, I have never left school. And I have so many students. I haven't taught in ooh, many, many years, but I taught high school here in Dallas. Teaching is the thing I love most. And I came back here, though. I was gone almost 30 years. And I came back when I retired in 2017. And I've run into some of my students that I taught in high school I started teaching in 1972, which I think was the second year of integration. That that's a, that's a book. It was seven years, and those white folk did not want us at that school. But I came to work every day, did what I was supposed to do, because there were black kids there and there were white kids there too. I had to teach them all, and it was a good experience for me because I was 21 when I started teaching, and so they were like 15, 16, 17, 18. So I'm not that much older, and so. Two of them came to the book signing we had here at the African-American Museum. I have never been as happy to see two people in my life. (laughs) And they were just saying, you saved us. There was a coach there too. And they said, you and coach saved us. Because, you know, just imagine being 17 and going, and they were athletes and that helped them too. And being in an environment where you're the minority, you know, they come by my room all the time. They had to go somewhere where they felt safe. Yeah. Just like where your heart can rest. Yeah. So I I love those kids. A lot of times in these podcasts, I ask who have been the people who have been the biggest influences on you. And so many people say one of their teachers Yes, and they know, and they say, oh, it was Miss Brown in third grade, she let me, you know, sit in her classroom after school when my parents were late to pick me up and she right. read to me. Like it, these people are so important. They have mm-hmm. so much power, so much power. I could tell you some stories and I will tell you one quick that this was just so funny. My grandson is eight. One of them is eight and they call me every day on the way from school. So he has to tell me something every day. He says, Amy. Did you know Mahalia Jackson stabbed Martin Luther King and said, if you sneeze or cough, you die? I said, I think you have that wrong. I said, it was not Mahalia Jackson. This happened in 1958. He's got pieces of it right. Mm -hmm. King was in Harlem and this woman stabbed him very close to the heart with a letter opener. She was mentally ill. 
And later on, the doctor said that if he had sneezed or coughed, he died. So you can see the parts of it uh, that he got right. But the teacher had also been talking about Mahalia Jackson that day. I said, you got parts of it right and blah, blah, blah. And I was trying to tell him the true story, woman's name and all that. And he said, but Mr. Peabody said, and Mr. Peabody is his teacher. He's the authority. And every time we tried to correct him, you know, he says, no, but Mr. Peabody said. <laughs> and that's just how, that just shows the power. Now, here's your grandmother, your mother, your brother. We're all telling you this. <laughs> we found it took two or three days. Got it straightened out. But it just shows how much influence that the teacher has. And all I've tried to do is be like them. Yeah. You know, to me, like having such a theme of preserving history and the way that like the future happens is just time and relationships Mm -hmm. and learning and individuals moving forward. I mean, like, I, I feel like sometimes this subject of history as like a formal school subject where you learn about it in books, it's this different entity. As I'm talking to you, I, I'm just realizing like history is being made in every conversation, in every relationship. Yes. And it is the foundation with which the future is forming. Yes. This one other thing with United Negro College Fund, I went back to my alma mater to teach after uh, I taught high school for seven and a half years. And then one day I just decided. I'm not coming back next year. I I don't want to teach high school anymore. And I just quit with no no plan. And this same woman I just told you about, I ran into her one day in a mall and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm not doing anything. I had a a kindergarten and a little baby. She says, well, come out and see me. So I went out to the college and she hired me to run a communication skills lab. This is me with no plan, which is most of my life. It was just a a wonderful thing. And we got a new president and he called me in one day and I had a master's degree at that time. It was in reading. And I got a call from his assistant and she said, Dr. Wright wants to see you. And I'm like, oh, why does he want? I I had no idea. And he worked at the college when I was there as a professional of religion. And I didn't, I wanted to have him. Everybody wanted his class. He was so wonderful, but I was too late. I, I didn't get it. I got somebody else. But I went up to his office to see him and he said, I want you to be chair of the English department. And I said, no, I, I was just just totally thrown off. I, and I said, oh, absolutely not. He says, no, 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 Helen. He says, they don't like each other, but they all like you. He says, you've got to do this. Can you imagine? These are all people with earned PhD, brilliant folk. And I was reluctant and he just forced it on me. And he said, however, you have to start on your doctorate. Hmm. And I said, well, okay, I mean, what do I, I mean, I had my kids, I was divorced by then and I, I, I took the job. They were all very happy because they were happy that it wasn't one of the others. Right. <laughs> There's no need to fight if he was right. So here I am, 29, I think I was. Wow. So I got into graduate school at Texas Woman's. I had all these things. I, I had so many things going on at the time and, you know, just trying to get everything done. And I got this letter or somebody gave it to him. I can't remember circumstances, but it was from the United Negro College Fund to all professors at member colleges. It said that you could apply for this scholarship, fellowship, that they would give you $10,000 a year if you're working towards your PhD. Mm. And Andy, I applied and they gave it to me. Yes. I could go to school full time and work on my doctorate. They gave me $20,000. They gave me Two consecutive years, they gave me $10,000. This was in 1981, 82, and 82, 83. I finished all of my coursework while I was working. Wow. They gave me that. I love the United Negro College Fund. I have given them all that money back that they gave me. Yeah. It was an amazing gift. All this stuff just fell into my lap. And these are my own people helping me. I have an obligation. I, I can't not help other people. If you're living your path that you're kind of here for, you have these helping hands, you have these things that happen, these synchronicities. Right. And I've never been a person who, who just pray for things because the scripture says you'll be given the desires of your heart, that you will be supplied with your needs. And I just figure that's going to happen. 
It's in the universe. It's just going to happen for me. Mm -hmm. It's automatic. I don't have to beg and plead because I see that as a promise on my life. I show gratitude for that because I am verbally, but I also show gratitude by helping other people. Mm -hmm. This is the most I've talked about it. I mean, it's not anything to talk about. You just do. You know, I was saying to somebody, yes, somebody who was complaining to me about something, some process we're doing. And I said, I'll tell you what Ray Charles said. I attribute it to Ray Charles. I don't know whether he said it or not. It's let it do what it do. Because we don't need to mess with everything. (laughs) Some stuff is just going to happen. We got to be in the right space. And sometimes I want to rush things, you know, I'm, I'm not patient enough. And I know that. And I know I have to exercise patience. But I just, it's like my mother told us. You make sure you're doing the right things. If you're doing the right things, it's going to come to you. Mm. I, I just believe that. That's how I've lived my life. If it's abundance, I'll have it. If it's scarcity, I'll have it. And then with the scarcity, I got to figure out how I'm going to get to abundance or how I'm going to reside in scarcity. Your spirit reminds me so much of the spirit of the of India, who was the founder of the Feather Pipe. This just like unwavering trust and belief that it's going to work out. It always does. Like you don't have to mess too much with it. We really just have to be here. And and so much of her life was service as well and helping other people. Like what you just said, it's like, how could I not? Mm-hmm. I've been given these things and I've been given this life and how could I not pay that forward? How, how could you not? I feel and have felt for a long time that, I'm a work in progress. If I get to be 90, I think I'll st- still feel that way. I'm just developing and learning and just trying to get it right. You know, just live a, a life that's meaningful. I went on that retreat because I was feeling, um, I did a lot of work last year. I wanted to go on a silence retreat, but I thought they put me out. I didn't think last year I was ready to go on, you know, because you just cannot talk. And I went back and forth and back and forth about going. And then all of a sudden, one morning I said, I'm, I'm going to do it. And it was the best thing I've done for myself. It checked all the boxes for me for what I needed then. And I learned some stuff and it forced me to slow down and just being at Feathered Pipe and, you know, up there where the canopy is. It is just so beautiful. I was in search of just peace that I needed at that time and not working no phone Mm -hmm. because I have all this stuff going all the time. And that whole week I I didn't have any phone. I didn't have, it was, it was wonderful. And I was taking care of myself. Is there anything about the, the land, the place, the people, the workshop itself, like anything that felt particularly special or particularly uh, nourishing? Just the things that we were doing with our bodies I got up every morning and I'm an early riser anyway. Every morning I went to that, that session, I went to all the sessions. So that, that was really good. That was a disciplining activity for me and just being in that space with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. That's another important part of it. I think of that experience. I, I didn't think I could do it, but I did it. So it was really refreshing for me. And then to meet people, meet Howard and Eric and those guys, it was just, and then VJ, and she, she brought me this necklace. I wear it. I don't have it on this morning, but I wear it a lot. seems like you're still in touch with some of the people that you met there too. Oh yes. With two, two others. One lives in Arizona. The other lives in Los Angeles. So we had a phone call Sunday a week ago. We did a zoom call and we we're planning another get together. And we went to an opera in LA in November. We just all met in LA for the weekend. We had a ball and these are people I met there. Dr. Helen Benjamin, a brave and fierce woman who no doubt has left you inspired and ready to overcome the obstacles in your life. Talking with Helen was such a gift of perspective, and it felt like we time traveled together. Her reflecting on her early life, visiting her grandparents, getting her first car, and the big moments of testing the waters of desegregation, sitting in the front of the bus and ordering the hamburger at the local restaurant that historically she hadn't been allowed to do. 
Her accent even reminds me slightly of my own grandmother, who grew up in Virginia and is now in the spirit world. So this conversation and editing process touched my heart in ways that I didn't quite expect. Above all, I'm leaving this conversation with the awareness that we are all living different realities at once, and how important it is to take into account that my experience isn't universal, and that this doesn't have to be seen as a negative truth. Thank goodness we have differences. Thank goodness not everyone sees the world the same. And how can we celebrate each other, uplift each other, and make space for everyone's experiences to be held in reverence and recognition? To hear more from Dr. Helen Benjamin, buy her book, How We Got Over, Growing Up in the Segregated South, and read about her life in Louisiana, as well as the first-hand accounts of her classmates from Peabody High School, class of 1968. A big shout out to Matthew Marsalek and the Drum Brothers, whose music you hear at the beginning and end of this podcast, as well as Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolin, who first turned us on to the phenomenon of the dandelion effect and how ideas move through the world. This podcast is brought to you by the Featherpipe Foundation. Help support us and donate at featherpipe.com slash gratitude. Also share this episode with your friends if you think it can be helpful. This is the most organic way that the show grows, and we even get to meet people at the ranch who first heard about us through a friend sharing a podcast. So keep the dandelion effect going, and until the next episode, have a beautiful day.